The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. For all of you that have been paying attention, and we're going to deepen your spiritual connection. Um, <clears throat> just keep in mind that from the very beginning, all biblical revelation is concerning God and man. God wants a relationship. He wants that connection. And we know that they that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. And he's a covenant-making God. And he wants, he wants the kind of relationship to where the greater wants to pour forth his love on the lesser. So our covenant is really quite a privilege to know that the lesser is connected to the greater. But it also depicts the heart of the Father to want to lavish the love, which is his nature and his essence. And we're going to talk more about nature and essence, of course, because you can't deepen a relationship without deepening the nature. And <clears throat> so from the beginning, let us make man in our image, and that it was not good for man to be alone. Those two factors. God wants relationship with him and with one another. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the Bible also depicts that in a spiritual connection, in a relationship, it either produces life or death. And as a believer, our relationship is to be with him, a righteousness. A righteousness means right standing or in right relationship, right connection. So uh, he's the source of life. And that's where you want your connection. And then your interpersonal connections need to be equally yoked. And it will determine the quality of the relationship. Now, uh, the key that we repeat often in, in, in our fellowship is something to keep you balanced with your scriptural understanding is that you relate to God the same way you relate to people. You don't ever get into the deception that God you love is those people that are always irritating you. Uh, you relate to God in the same way you relate to people. You relate to people the same way you relate to God. So look at your personal relationships. Before you get into some religious mindset that you've got this great relationship with God, look at how great is your relationship with people. Because you can't say you love God and hate your brother. It's that simple. And so those, those characteristics are key. And... Uh, Personal relationships can be casual, they can be deep. And today we're going to really emphasize going deeper. And there's some truths that God has revealed. Uh, some of the characteristics of a, of a quality relationship are mutuality. Uh, Jennifer always used to say, when, sometimes I would talk with people, I would see that they were, quite frankly, they leaned too much toward consuming rather than contributing. And I would say it has to be a two-way relationship. And Je Jennifer says, I'm not sure that they know what a two-way relationship is. And, you know, it can be different, too, even in measure, like an employee and employer. Well, it, the, the, it's mutual, but it's different. Um, and that's the same way it is with all our relationships. But consumers have a way of just pulling and getting what I can for me. And we're going to cover that a little bit later. Get what I can for me, and it's not about uh, reconciling or giving of myself. And Christianity, the key is the giving of yourself. So that would have to be remedied. That should be uh, something that we want to allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts. Uh, the, so the, the one characteristic is mutuality. It's got to be a, a two-way street. It's got to be uh, con contribution as well as consuming and, and drinking in. God wants a two-way relationship with you, and he also wants a two-way relationship with people. Uh, I remember early on uh, in, in uh, my marriage with Jennifer, uh, she had learned out of a really domineering relationship just not to talk. And so if she got her feelings hurt, she wouldn't say anything. And it surprised her for me to say, Jennifer, if I hurt your feelings, say that I hurt your feelings. Tell me, say, hey, don't do such and such or when you do it. Because otherwise, keeping it to yourself and covering it up with something is not a relationship. It's false. It's not real. And I actually have to teach her how to, how to talk back to me. 
oh dear, pray for me. What a, what a terrible thing any man would have to do is teach somebody how to talk back. But in reality, it could be redemptive. You might know there's a time to speak and there's a time to be silent. But a real relationship needs to be two-way. You can't just sweep everything under the rug. There can't be, uh, some even use the code of silence as a form of punishing in a relationship. That's not a healthy relationship. So the second element is that it's a shared life. Uh, the core of it for a believer now is spirit. The uh, unbelievers don't un even understand spiritual truth because it's like foolishness to them. But spiritual truth is the body without the spirit is dead. So we are spirit and we're supposed to live from the spirit and we're supposed to walk in the spirit, but we need to know what that's like in practical terms. But the mutuality is a shared life and a sharing life involves interaction of the spirit. Um, if you notice, if you ever uh, run into somebody, uh, Christians and Christian circles, you're, you are to relate by spirit to spirit, heart to heart. You run into people that you'll notice that when you talk to them, you feel like you hit a wall. Then there's other times you will talk to somebody and you'll feel, oh, I feel so connected to that person. That is a spiritual reality. That's not just a mental uh, reasoning. Uh, recently, I even saw something, I don't know if it was on Facebook or where it was, but they were talking about empathy and empathetic communication. And they had it all listed as body language, you know, the kind of expression a person makes. When that is not discernment. That is a counterfeit. Body language is not empathetic communication. You know one another by the spirit. We know one another no longer according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. People that have been raised in alcoholic families or abusive families, they learn to, to, uh, to pay attention to expression. Is he or she angry? Are they upset? Did they have a good day? If they had a bad day, I'm going to pay. And they get very oriented to expressions on people's faces. But that's the devil's playground. He would love to get you to do that because then you go into a paranoia instead of a discernment. Discernment gets the motive or the source. That kind of observation gets you an opinion and a judgment. And that in itself can take you down the wrong road. Uh, the third element or characteristic of a, of a spiritual connection is that it's a separate reality. And we always talked about that so many times. People want to uh, deal with their marriage relationship. And they say, we want you to help us with our marriage. And failing to understand that relationship is like this separate entity. There's the woman, there's the husband, there's a separate entity called relationship, and they want you to fix that like, come on, counselor, fix that. That's a mess over there. It's certainly not my fault. And then the other party's going, well, it's not me. It's, it's that other person. No, well, fix this then. Failing to understand you want to fix this entity called a relationship, you start with you dealing with your stuff and you deal with your stuff. When the man deals with his stuff and the woman deals with her stuff, you will actually affect this thing, this entity called relationship. And so uh, understanding that, uh, it's, that it really is a reality and can't be explained in, in just rational terms, but... Ask any mother who's bearing a child in her womb if there isn't a reality to that relationship, even though at this point it's, it's the, the mother is being the primary giver and the child is the receiver. But then ultimately when that child is born, there's this separation that takes place, this individuation where that's mommy's nose, that's my nose, I'm a different person. And then the relationship can begin to, to build. And there is a relationship that's tangible. Young parents, they, they love to see when the child starts to talk, because then that's like, oh, now I've got a little human here who's actually talking, and aren't they cute, and they're saying this, and they say that. Art Linkletter, back in the day, many, many decades ago, he built an entire TV industry on children say the darndest things. 
So he, he saw that there's, there's this back and forth that takes place. Well, you know what? I believe God sits in heaven and says, my children are the darndest things. I'll tell you what. Did you see what they just did? Now, isn't that cute? Have you seen my servant Job? He was bragging on Job to the devil. Have you seen my servant Job? So there's times he talks good about that, and there's times like, what? Have I been with you so long? You still aren't standing? Do you have a stupid spirit or something? What's going on with you people? So there's, there's a relationship that has both loving correction, but it also has instruction on how to live. So let's emphasize the fact that when we talk about spiritual connections, and today I want to go deeper spiritual connections, that this is a relationship with God, and this, this applies to all of life. A relationship with God requires an investment in ourselves and giving ourselves wholly to God. Um, I've shared this in, uh, in, in another message on spiritual connections that uh, I enjoyed to deepen the relationship was making sure that I didn't just know what the Word said, but that I walked in the reality of that Word. And so... Uh, I put, did many different attributes and characteristics of God that I fell in love with and everything, but the, the, the simplest one that meant a lot was out of the Amplified Bible when it talked about, I will send you the Holy Spirit, I will send you the Helper. In the Amplified, it has all the various characteristics of this precious person of the Holy Spirit that is sent to us, and that he's first of all our teacher. And so I would walk with them in a relationship of, I have an anointing that abides within. Teach me, Holy Spirit. Teach me. Teach me. And that attitude actually enhanced the relationship. I didn't want information. I wanted to know his nature as a teacher of me. I wanted to be the student. And he would uh, give me scriptures like, uh, morning by morning, I open your ear to hear as a disciple. Uh, he was the helper. You know how many times, and probably should do it even more often now, um, sometimes I think we take matters into our own hands now because we think we've matured. Uh, but the helper was, I saw God move remarkably beautiful in my life as a baby Christian when I would just say, help. <laughs> oh, wow, I don't know what to do. Matter of fact, I, I learned most of, of the ability to uh, minister uh, emotional healing to people by simply doing it and going, help, I don't know what to do with that person. They just said something I never heard before, help. And he, he would come through because if it's a redemptive mindset, he's not only your teacher, he's your helper. And then I realized too that he's an intercessor. And I used to go, oh God, pray for me. <laughs> yeah, isn't that what people say to other people? I'll just say, I'd rather, I'd rather, God, what's on your heart? What's on your mind? You're my intercessor. You're my advocate. I need somebody on my side, someone that will take my cause as long as it's righteous. He'll be your advocate. You don't want to make him your enemy. You want to keep him as your lawyer. You want to keep him on retainer. To keep him on retainer, you have to be obedient. And then I learned him as my counselor. A wonderful counselor searches the heart. And God basically in that relationship made me appreciate to be God-searched rather than man-searched. I know man moves in the Holy Spirit and man can move with his giftings, but I still have the most confidence in, in, in focusing on God-searched over man-searched. Because we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when God searches the heart, he knows all things. I like to go to the source. If, I'm, if I got some tangles and some messes in me, people could have some insight. They can help. But I'm, in reality, it's going to be ultimately God searching my heart for what's tangled. Because he knows the sequence, the timing, and the order to facilitate a healthy change. So he's my counselor, and he's my comforter. And probably one of the things that I saw as far as having a mutual relationship, it was, oh, not comfort me, God, comfort me. I, oh, God, I'm having a bad day. Comfort me, comfort me. To understand that as a mutual sharing of life, God basically would say, 
the same comfort whereby you've been comforted, you need to release that comfort to other people. And you can't give them something you don't have. So I learned that the comforter was one which, like all of these, he, he required me to do the same thing. He wanted me to be a teacher, a disciple that would teach others. He wanted me to be a helper, one that would show people, go this way, don't go that way. He wanted me to intercede for other people. He wanted me to be an advocate for people, for, the, for the, even the downtrodden, that uh, God is a solution-oriented God. There's hope for everybody. There's nobody beyond hope. And comfort, you can't give them something. That's, a pat on the back is not the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The comfort of the Holy Spirit is a word in season to them that are weary. And if that word has the anointing or the nature of God on it, it will accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. And then lastly, he was my standby. He was always there. I can remember walking down the hall and just weeping when I realized, you know, friends come and go. Friends have issues, there's deep friendships, there's superficial friendships. Um, some have been they're with the Lord now and they're not, not available, so to speak. But the Holy Spirit was the best friend I have ever had. And it just made me weep that He never left me or forsake me. I might do my little temper tantrum and kind of go off course, but He was always there and always available. And whenever I would call on Him, He would answer. And so I saw those characteristics are something that when the Helper comes, as the Scripture says in John 15, 26, I shall send to you from the Father the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father and He will testify of me. Now, we talked about spiritual connections um, in the past and now I said uh, we want to go deeper into the spiritual connections. So building a love relationship with the Holy Spirit is the absolutely essential beginning. And this is interesting. Uh, something I just came across recently, too. Uh, I want to make sure I don't forget. 1 Corinthians 2.16, I believe it was, uh, said that we have the mind of Christ. And I don't know how I missed it all this time, but this has been essentially our ministry in essence, is that mind, will, and emotions. But I always read that we have the mind of Christ, we have his thoughts. But it actually in the Amplified says, when you have the mind of Christ, you have the mind, you have his feelings, and you have his purposes or his motives. You don't have the mind of Christ unless you know how he feels about something and what his purpose is in it. So information then suddenly explodes into, do you know or do you really know? And if we're going to go deeper in spiritual truth, that's going to be something we're going to have to be open to. And I know the mind of the Spirit. Romans 8, 27, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. We know he's got thoughts. We know that he has thoughts towards you. And the will, but the one and the same Spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Oh, God's got a will. I've got a will. The goal would be to know what his thoughts are and what his purpose is, what his will is, what's his intent, what's his motive. And get this, because um, this is going to be important. We're going to cover this in a little bit. But then there's also the emotions. It says, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit. In Romans 15:30 through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit. That's the nature or the essence of the Spirit, through the love of the Spirit. So we know he's got a mind. We know he's got a, a will. We know he's got emotions, uh, uh, the comfort of the Holy Spirit. All right. So there's the feelings that are involved. There's the will or the purpose or his intent. And it's always redemptive, always. God is The name of the game is redemption, and God is basically always going to give you even a corrective word for the purpose of redemption. Uh, and I learned that the person of the Holy Spirit was not an it. If you're going to deepen your relationship with the Lord, and you're going to deepen that connection, you, you need to say, Holy Spirit, I want to honor you as a person, that it's not something 
or power that I use, but rather that I am a vessel and I allow you to use me. There's a difference there. Uh, if it's an it, you have a tendency to use an it, a thing. But when it's a person, you show respect. Now, to honor the Holy Spirit, uh, there's actually even a warning in Scripture just to show you that we don't ever turn it to an it or say it's of the devil. Because Matthew 12, verses 30, 32, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy, blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven. For whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. We have to be very cautious of calling somebody false, calling somebody new age. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a lack of sensitivity uh, to the Holy Spirit. If you don't know, God would appreciate you saying not know, because if you start out not knowing, you can find out. You search the matter out. Wisdom searches a matter out. It doesn't just form a, a gut opinion. Now, what the Lord really dealt with me recently is, Dennis, you, there's two things that need to change. One is you've got to more effectively look at motive because people can look at their Christian life based on their performance. Say, I didn't kill anybody. I didn't do this. I didn't. But God says, but did you want to? <laughs> All right. The motive is the key. And if we're going to advance in deeper spiritual relationship, we can't just look at our outward behavior. We have to say, Holy Spirit, search me for anxious thoughts and hurtful ways. Search me for motive. And the second thing is familiarity. Boy, he got me on this one. He says, do you know early on the things that I taught you, Dennis, that right now they're in books and everything? He said, there's not a truth, not a truth, that God has revealed to you that you cannot go deeper. So watch out for, I already knew that. Oh, I heard that before. Well, maybe you're hearing it again because you haven't really applied it. Maybe it needs to go deeper, as we used to say tactfully <laughs> when someone was, they already, I already dealt with that. I already knew that, you know, and that's a very common prayer. But God says, I want to do in this time, in this hour, now this is probably one of the um, uh, end of the year messages here, but he's, he's saying in the, in the season ahead, he's mandating me to take those things that you think you've already known, that you even have revelation on it. Deeper spiritual truth is to actually go deeper in what you think you've already known. God, you know, forgiveness of sin. You could take a baby Christian there and then go, yeah, I understand that I received forgiveness and I got saved. Then you can take someone a little further down the road, walking in the second level of it's no longer I that live, but Jesus the Messiah that lives in me. And you have them say that, and it's, it's, it's a whole different ball game. All of a sudden, they have the same revelation about forgiveness, but they're coming from a more mature work of the cross. And likewise, it can even be furthered into mothers and fathers in Christ can say, forgiveness, that's something that, I'm, that is so real to me that I was so forgiven. Instead of it being about me, it's that this is what I want to issue out. I want to have a forgiveness lifestyle that flows as naturally as breathing. And say, so you know that truth, do you? Then let's take it deeper. Because God is always saying there's absolutely no revelation that you have. Those things that you wrote in the front of your Bible, even as a new Christian, you, sh you should be going deeper into the nature and the character. God didn't give you those arbitrarily. Any scripture that God gave you that stood out to you over the years, is there to keep you aligned properly and also to encourage you to pursue it even more. You don't know it yet. You know it at a level. God says, I want deeper spiritual relationship with my children. I'm looking for those who are going to pursue me relentlessly. I'm looking for someone that's, that's saying uh, more, Holy Spirit. I want to go not new truth, deeper nature in the truth that you've already revealed to me. Uh, we talk about first level work of the cross, second level, third level work of the cross. All of that implies that there's a, there's, there may be a crisis experience to where you get a revelation 
and a deeper work of the cross, but it's only the beginning. You still have to walk it out progressively. And God's looking for that, that I might know him, Philippians 3.10, that I might progressively know him, progressively walk in a deeper and fuller relationship of understanding with him, that I might come to know all those intricacies, all those attributes and characteristics that I might know, know experientially. That's not know in my head, I already, because the argument would be, I already know that verse of Scripture. I can quote Philippians 3.10. That's not what he's asking for. He's asking for a fact that I want you to honor God in this season. And when it says, I really want to honor him as a person and respect the Holy Spirit as a person, I don't want to grieve him. The Scripture says, putting away lying, stealing, Anything that would grieve him, be honest. Are you grieving the Holy Spirit? Do what I did. I asked the Lord to convict me, make my conscience even more tender. I'm not talking about walking in condemnation. There's people who do that themselves. They can condemn themselves and think they're calling a conviction of the Holy Spirit. No, I'm just saying, with the loving conviction of the Holy Spirit, make my conscience more sensitive. Make it shout in areas that normally I would just kind of pass over. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. That's the way I honor God. I don't want to quench or resist the Holy Spirit. I don't want to even worse. Isaiah 63, 10 says, but they rebelled <laughs> and vexed the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he became their enemy. I don't want the Holy Spirit to be my enemy. I want him to be my friend, my my standby, my helper, my teacher, my comforter, my counselor. I wanted all those aspects of his nature. I don't want to be an enemy. So I'm going to have to look for deeper spiritual connections. You know, one of the practical things you can do, you know, sometimes you say, I don't know exactly how to pray. I don't know exactly what the Lord is saying totally. Well, he's always looking for that intimacy. And there's, there's one thing you can do during the day. And this helped me with understanding there's private time or special time and all the time. And I don't go in and out of prayer. That's a self-life that is spiritual one minute and then self-independent self the next. But to gather the concept that it's special time, and it's just like Jesus' walk. He walked with the Father with special time, and then he walked with him all the time. There was no in and out. And when God says, in the day-to-day -day process of doing that, there's two things that can be done. Pray in the Spirit, because praying in the Spirit does two things. It builds you up in the most holy faith, and it keeps yourself in the love of God. So if you're just driving down the road, you don't have to have specifics. You don't have to have a download of revelation, but you can. Uh, so that you're not distracted by your circumstances or traffic on the road. You can pray in the Spirit. It'll keep you down in the love of God, and it builds you up spiritually. It causes the Spirit to be more sensitive and more prevailing, more preeminent. Uh, and that's really what we want. We want to put them first place. That's a very practical way during the day. Now, the Holy Spirit points to Jesus. And... We're to be Jesus-centered, and our focus are 1 Corinthians 2.16, but we have the mind of Christ, and I've said this already, it just, it just opened up to me that if you're going to pursue a deeper relationship with God, have the mind of Christ is not just be a word person. I, I mean, that's a good thing to be a word person, but not in the mere communication or memorization of the word. A word person knows his nature. They, he knows the source of that word. So it's his thoughts, his feelings, and the purposes of his heart. There's the challenge right there. I know we've said a lot about uh, uh, relationship and going deeper in your spiritual connection, but if you only took from this message that truth and really applied it to your life, you would see a, a, a very specific change. And that is when you say we have the mind of Christ, let this mind be in you and start thinking in terms of I won't take the thoughts as the written ink on the page, but by the living spirit, 
I see that I have his mind, I have his thoughts, I have his feelings, and I have his will and intent to be accomplished. He's redemptive. It's a love heart. It's a redemptive heart. I think we've gotten to the point where God is calling us back to a place where I want you to know what he said. I want you to know how he feels about it. And I want you to see what the ultimate intent is. And there's a reason for that. And because here, here's where we're going to get into it. Now we're going to go deeper yet, as far as I'm concerned. Any revelation can go deeper. Otherwise, you will take it for granted. That's right. You'll take it for granted. I know that. And the two areas that I see God dealing with, two very important areas, man, in Revelations 2, he, he was talking to Ephesus. I love the book of Ephesians because that was the mature church. You want to see God was talking to a mature church. He wasn't talking to baby Christians in Revelations 2, but he said, nevertheless, I have this against you. You have less, left your first love. That is the crux of where I'm trying to go to. God is telling us all, I don't care where you're at, what level of relationship you have. He wants you to return to first love. And he was talking here to a mature church. So I said, so what, what would have caused a mature church to need that loving rebuke? What did they do wrong? He said, you've left your first love. But he said, you've been tested. You've, you've uh, proved those that were called apostles and they're not, they're liars. You persevered, you have patience, you labored for my name's sake, you have not become weary. Those are all good words for right now. You've not become weary because the enemy is trying to wear out the saints of the Most High God. You persevered, you've been patient. Uh, I've, I've seen your works, your labor, your patience. You can't bear with those that are evil. Uh, and you've even tested those who say they're apostles and found them to be liars. So I'm recognizing the relationship we have. I'm recognizing and encouraging. Keep on doing the good stuff that you're doing. But I have this against you. You've left your first love. So remember, therefore, where you have fallen. Repent. And repentance is simply you recognizing that somehow first love which is really means your best love has kind of, oh, I've heard even pastors say this when they've been under stress and stuff. They say, I feel like I'm just going through the motions of Christianity. If you feel like you're just going through the motions, you've lost first love. You've got to purify your motive. You're just, you're just doing by rote uh, actions and reactions and trying to be Christian. God's saying, you're going to return, you return to first love. First is not just first in sequence, it's first in importance. And during times of distraction, you can start looking at everything else and God. And God says, I want you to look at me first and foremost. I want to be sequentially first, and I want to be characteristically important important first. Um, so here's the two things. He that had ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, because you need to hear this. One, he's saying purify your motive. Don't say you know that. Secondly, repent of the familiarity. That's right. The familiarity. I already know that. God's saying, your motive should be to be pursuing me and to cleansing me and deepening that relationship with me. Not survival, but pursuing me more intimately, that you might be more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of my personhood. Are you doing that? Let that motive be searched in your heart. Ephesians 3.16, remember we said Ephesians is the mature church. It says that he would grant you according to the riches of glory to be strengthened by power of the Spirit in the inner man. This is what he wants. These apostolic prayers uh, to the Ephesian church was that you would pursue 
and repent of the familiarity. Yes, you, 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 you're knowledgeable. Yes, you've walked in great truth. Yes, I've already encouraged the good things that you're doing, but uh, you've lost your first love. You've lost your best love. And so it says, I want to grant you according to the riches of its glory to be strengthened by his spirit in the inner man so that, here's the intent, then we, we want to know his nature, we want to know his feelings, we want to know the intent of his heart, we want to know his thoughts, and these are the thoughts of the Word of God, that to the intent that Messiah might dwell in your heart through faith, so that you'll be rooted and grounded in love, so that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints the width, the length, the height, and the depth. And you know, the width, the length, the height, and the depth should be a perfect cube. And I can remember when God was teaching me that, he would show me what part of that cube is, is not as strong. It's not as intact. The height, your worship to God, your length, your vision to the purposes of God, the depth that you're rooted and grounded in Him, the width to where you live and walk in the mundane, in, in the, the way you handle yourself in the world around you, at work, at home, uh, in private. God wants that to be developed, that you might know the love of Messiah. That surpasses knowledge. So again, you return to your first love. You're going to go past your knowledge. You're going to go into experiential knowledge of Him. And this is what He's asking for. I looked at the things that God had revealed to me. I had uh, major leaders in the church that when I was a young pastor, they saw some of these truths that God had given to me and I said, of course, it's not like so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so, and I'd name different names who had material out at the time. And, and they got me on the corner, and they said, actually, Dennis, this is not to brag or anything, but they said, we believe yours is superior because it's not information, it's revelation of relationship. And so I looked at it, and I'm looking at it again. I feel like I'm starting all over again, because God's going to say, I want you to go deeper, deeper, in your spiritual connection. So these things that you know and have experienced and have walked in, you haven't seen anything yet. You need to walk in them far deeper. You know, forgiveness of sins, something as simple as that. You know, it means one thing to a baby Christian, it means something else to someone that's mature. And God's saying this goes for you as well. And so here's what, here's what he started with. He started telling me that way back in the beginning, the life-changing concept was that his thoughts were continually toward me. Well, you know what? If we have the mind of Jesus the Messiah, and we do hold the thoughts, the feelings, and the purposes of his heart, I want that undivided attention. He says, in the Living Bible, he says, my thoughts are continuously toward you. That's right, even when you're sleeping, his thoughts are continuous. Are you aware of them? Does he awaken you morning by morning? Does he awaken your ear to hear? He's speaking, are you listening? Are you going deeper into that relationship with him that you pursue his mind, his will, and his emotions? To honor him, I don't want to grieve his emotions. To honor him, I want to obey his purposes, or my will is his will. One of the things he showed me was that that I used to feel like my will was a handlebar. You know, when you try to do something yourself, or you, you, you try to hold on and white-knuckle it, so to speak, because you're going to control the situation. God said, if you give me that bar that you're holding on to and you release that bar, I'll make that bar the scepter of the king. And what I say goes, goes. What I say is released, was released. It's his authority and it's his love nature. Your will needs to cross with his will and become a scepter of righteousness. That scepter has the authority of heaven behind it. And it doesn't have the authority simply because you can quote the Bible. It has authority behind it because the, the nature, the purpose, the feelings, and the mind of Jesus are attached to it. He told me, 
personhood that I might know him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of his personhood, that I can know it more clearly, that I might perceive things of his nature that I would search out. I would search for him, I would find him, when of course it was searching with all my heart. So first love has a way of having intensity. And again, if you're watching this and uh, it's a lot of information perhaps, but I'll tell you what, if you go before God and say, purify my motives. And secondly, I repent of any familiarity of going through the motions. You would see the kind of change begin for the days ahead and preparation for the days ahead. Uh, awareness of that development God showed me that there's a way to wait that is not just passive. It's, it's a way of waiting, uh, just like in uh, Habakkuk. I will stand upon the post of my observation. I will wait. But that means I'm waiting with a confident expectation that I'm going to hear something. Not I'm well, I don't know. I'm not getting nothing. <laughs> but rather, I will wait with an attitude of the heart because I'm connected to him. If I disconnect, I start to fear, doubt, and unbelief. But if I'm staying connected with him, I will wait upon the Lord to see what he will say to me. I mean, I can feel love in that, to see what he will say to me. Remember, my thoughts are towards you, and they're available. You pursue first love, and it's, you're going to hear what I have to say about you, and it's going to melt your heart. So I'm going to see, and then I'll know what to speak. I want to speak out of the revelation of the relationship and the authority of the scepter of God to change lives, not information. And so that's going to be incumbent upon me to go deeper in the things that I think I know. I'm going to learn to do, secondly, not only apply that kind of attention to personhood, but I'm going to have to learn how to welcome his presence. This is a good test. Uh, we've taught this um, before, and God's going to have me go deeper, make my conscience shout in some of these areas. They go, I know that. But he's saying, welcome the presence of God to the seven thrones. Welcome him into your spirit. Let him search the heart. Be God-searched. No walls. Let him have your thoughts and give him his thoughts, which are higher. His will, his emotions, your physical body. Offer him my body, a living sacrifice. In the days ahead, you're going to hear that scripture more and more and more because it's offering the entirety. You get focused on... Uh, on the, on the physical body, God says, that's my body, and it's his body. And from head to toe, I am being a God-welcoming healer to my physical body and also to be an expression to do with my physical body what he sees fit. I surrender to that. There's a way to be searched. The spirit of man is a candle of the Lord. Search me, O God. Welcome his presence. To go deeper, he said to ask me whether you're trusting or trying. Listen to me. This is something that you need to write down and ask yourself and not say, oh, I know that. Ask yourself, Holy Spirit, reveal to me, am I trying or am I trusting? Again, it's a motive. Motive, his will will become your scepter and faith in his performance is where the authority lies. It isn't about what you can do. It's about what he can do through you, through that new creation. So motive, trying versus trusting. The next truth was attitude. And you know, it's never changed. Have this attitude that was in Jesus. And I looked at the character quality and the attributes. And we teach on that on the uh, core values uh, of personal freedom, justice, equality, loyalty, all of that. But the attitude that is the most significant to know and understand more than anything else 
is that the only true positive, write this down, the only true positive comes through a work of the cross, death, burial, and resurrection. I've seen people try to talk positive, and the words can be positive, but positive words and negative words are not in and of themselves life-changing. What is life-changing is those positive words, the true positive is that which is passed through death yet lives, that which has been accomplished by the power of the Spirit through a genuine work of the cross. You know, we make the negative sign and the plus sign for positive and negative. What God clearly wrote on the tablet of my heart many years ago was that, look at the cross. The cross is the true positive. It's got that sidebar at near the top, unlike the positive where it's just good or bad. It's redemptive is the true positive. Then I looked at the next attitude, and he was showing me about really discernment comes out of love. Discernment knows the source of something. And again, what it cuts through, if you know the motive or the source, it cuts through the right answer. Many people will give you the right answer, but there's no power or authority behind it because the motive is wrong. And, you know, ask yourself, if you truly want to know whether it's a positive motive, ask yourself, what I did in Christianity, whether it's my ministry, did I do it that the outcome would be for me or was the outcome for God and His purposes? That will cut to the core of motive. You know, am I trying to do in order to get for me, or am I doing for the motive of God because the purposes of God, His mind, His will, and His emotions are the motivating factor in my life? Now, I saw discernment, then, out of this relationship, you will discern God's self and others. And your love will overflow and abound in all real discernment. Your best discernment is when you're giving love. Love precedes peace. Peace precedes your perception of a, of a given situation. But God is saying that, remember Ephesians chapter 3? The Ephesian church was the mature church but they're being instructed by apostolic prayers in the scriptures. Ephesians 3 says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. That he would grant you to be strengthened with his spirit in the inner man so that Messiah could dwell in your hearts. So that being rooted and grounded in the love of God that you might comprehend with all the saints the width, the length, the height, and the depth. The balance. And to know, and this is worth writing down, intent, remember? We don't just want to know what the word says. We want to know what is the intent. So that what? So that you would know the love of Messiah, which surpasses knowledge. Too much knowledge out there, not enough love of Messiah. Return to first love is what God is saying. Take all of those things that you know and that you've cherished and you've loved, that God has written even on the tablet of your heart, and say, go deeper. Uh, Jennifer remembers when we used to have to deal with people who had knowledge. And I already dealt with that. I love my mother. <laughs> and a lot of times there'd be anger or hostility coming from them while they're telling you they love their mother. We would have to say something like, we wouldn't say, no you don't, you don't love your mother. We would have to say something like, let's go deeper. But, but maybe, maybe we can love her more. And you know what? God is saying that to all of his children right now. You can go deeper. Don't think you know anything. Because God says, there is, there is a, an arena of kingdom that I want to reveal to you. I want to give you the, 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 the good things of the kingdom. So we're not going to say we already know that, right? We're going to say, I want to know in my knower how to go deeper into those truths that God has revealed to me so graciously. And if he revealed them to me so graciously, they're specifically designed for me. So find the truths that were specifically designed for me and go deeper, and you can't go wrong. God's going to 
take us by his spirit. And his spirit's going to bear witness with our spirit that we're children of God and that he's leading us, directing us. And he's going to show us that these things that are written on the tablet of your heart gives you life with a capital L. And then, <clears throat> of course, then the, the, the next truth, besides learning how to receive and have it written on a tablet of a heart, how to make the word become flesh, he took me to the last element, and that was demonstration or obedience. You live in the spirit, in a deeper spiritual connection, you have to walk the talk. Find out if you walk the talk or you just know the talk. You know, we can talk Christianese to everybody. But one of the things he taught me in my special time was write it down, Dennis. Did you know when you even write down or take notes, you're honoring God. You're showing him that you're doing your best to respond. Write it down. Better than that, absorb it. Drink it in. Drink and feed rather than think and read. Cherish it. Uh, Jennifer changed that to absorb. <laughs> when I said, well, this is the way God taught me to cherish it. Well, to cherish it is like, it's not just a truth. It's not just an aha moment. It's an aha. And you appreciate and you welcome it and you absorb it. So cherish for me added a dimension of going beyond, aha, oh, revelation, illumination. No, no, it went beyond that. It went to the place of appreciation and gratitude. And that in itself cultivates. It gets birthed in your heart, and it births a proper attitude. Absorb it, cherish it. And then, oh, listen to this. This is for all the people that love to pray the word. Pray the word, but don't just pray the word because you memorize the word. Pray that word that God wrote on the tablet of your heart, and it will accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. You see, God has to be attached to it. The name of Jesus doesn't work in the flesh. Oh, that ought to shock a few people, but it doesn't. It needs to come out of that relationship, out of that new creation reality. It is God who is at work both to will and to perform for his good pleasure. Wow. I looked at these seven truths that God said, and God saying, Dennis, you're going to return to first love. You're going to let me check out your motive. You're going to die to any familiarity, thinking that you know. But these seven truths were these. And if you're a note taker, you might want to write these down. First of all, he says, I'm going to give you my undivided attention. How are you going to respond? Secondly, I'm going to teach you to welcome my presence, but I'm going to make sure that I'm in charge of everything. You know, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Well, what does that look like? You could say that in an emotional state and not do it. I want your spirit, your mind, your will, your emotions, your physical body. Oh, I want all of your relationships. I'm going to look at all, how you handle all relationships. I want to see how you handle all of your uh, material possessions. Yeah, I want to look at that. I'm coming over. I'm coming to your house. I'm going to check it out. I'm going to see how you, your stewardship of all of your relationships and the stewardship of all of your possessions. Do you mind? I might show up when you at least expect me. So it would be wise to be prepared and humble yourself because I want best love. I want first love. And then he says, welcoming that presence. I'm going to teach you that in the welcoming of that presence, you're going to live by the true positive. No more just talking positive, living positive. Big difference, because when you live pro positive as opposed to talking positive, because you could, Christians, you could say the right answers, but living positive means that you have his mind, his feelings, and his purposes being released to you when you're walking in that. 
welcome. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you how to welcome my presence in all areas of your life. Thirdly, I'm going to deal with your motive to see if you're trying or trusting. It's that simple. It's not fight, flight, or faint. <laughs> it's yielding to my will and doing my will, co-laboring with me, trusting me with all your heart, leaning not on your understanding, acknowledging me in all your ways, and I will direct your path. I, that acknowledge means through divine, intimate connection. It's not up here. Lean not on this. Through divine, intimate connection. That attitude of your heart needs to be the true positive of the cross. Discernment. Dennis, I want you to reevaluate the height, the width, the length, and the depth, so that <laughs> you will be filled with the love of God that goes beyond knowledge. I want you to understand that love and discernment in this relationship. I want you to have these things affirmed in you. Affirmation. The Spirit himself bears witness of my spirit that I've got it. I'm a child of God and I am relating to him in it. And lastly, obedience. Demonstrate. I want to walk the talk. I don't know about you, but... Nobody really appreciates someone that can talk the talk and not walk the walk. And the world's not going to believe you anyway. Wow. Now we get to the best part. A deeper spiritual connection. What does it look like? Oh, we've given you a lot of ways and means and how-tos. But what does it look like? If I took those seven areas, undivided attention, welcome presence, ask where you trust, attitude, love and discernment, affirmation, demonstration, what would it look like? Well, first of all, undivided attention, you would no longer, prayer would no longer be controlled by your flesh. It'd be controlled by the spirit. Welcoming presence, you would be able to give because you can only give what you've received. So that's what it would look like. It would be a person that could give spiritual reality. Thirdly, God came in and he made you willing to trust. God says, you come in, here's what it's going to look like. You're going to get out of the way. That's what it'll look like. Ask where you trust. Attitude. Well, look at it. What kind of attitude? What would it look like? Well, God is everything. Self is now usable, and others are the object of God's love. There you go. That's what it would look like. You'd be usable. Wouldn't that be nice to know? And love and discernment. Well, God's already demonstrated his love toward us. Greater love has no one than a man lays down his life. And the greater works, we need to walk in greater love. You want the greater works? You're going to walk in greater love. Love is going to be essential, so therefore return to first love. Affirmation, uh, no flattery. We don't need the ministry of flattery or a pat on the back. It's going to be the effective miracle working power of a righteous man avails much, and it's going to have the capacity to do, to prevail, to strengthen, to work, to affirm other people, to facilitate redemptive transformation. And lastly, my speech and my preaching will not be with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. 1 Corinthians 4.20 For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power to change lives. Information won't change lives. The Holy Spirit will. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.